that's basic information about um, the second chapter strategy strategic planning the, the strategic planning concepts of strategy um, that's just the introduction part of it actual content we will be looking into the uh, other chapters um see uh, one point what i want to present here is spn syllabus is quite vast vast syllabus you have so the many things which have to be learned so learn them um, as the um, content is being delivered simultaneously you also study um, at home keep preparing the content is quite vast i do not know when are you when are your term exams or uh, semester exams uh, when are you planning to write the acc exams i have no idea but um, this lot of content which you have to study okay that part, part you just remember third chapter see about uh, strategic analysis so what strategic analysis that we have to learn see um and under the strategic analysis here we have this analyzing the external environment analyzing the internal environment the under external environment for us in the syllabus we have three different uh, concepts given external environment first one is uh, take up a pestal analysis next there are two models given by porter the first one talks about Porter's five forces of competition. Second one talks about Porter's diamond model. Okay. Um, what's pestle analysis? Pestle analysis. Um, the acronym can be elaborated as P stands for political, E economic, economic. S stands for social. T stands for technological. The second E stands for environmental and L stands for legal. Okay. The uh, in the external environment, see, these are the factors which which do affect the um, organization. So they will have uh, these factors have an impact on the organization. The political factors. See, it talks about the political stability. Um, uh, in the uh, in the environment in the economy uh, in the external environment see political stability whether it, there is stability or not also will have an impact um, see too many fluctuations too many changes um, political unrest is there in that in that economy uh, the firms also to get affected because of that instability so we look at the political factors the economic about it talks about the economy economy as to um, what's the development growth in that economy what is gdp what is the um, what is uh, the number of exports and imports um, that happen in the economy um, the income levels uh, of the people see the, they are dependent on the trade cycles in the economy so trade cycles um, um, per capita income disposable income um, those aspects are all economic. See, what's the interest rate prevailing in the economy? What's the inflation rate present there? What's the exchange rate when they are dealing with other countries and then um, uh, the foreign currency, how is it fluctuating, etc. So that those are all economic factors. It stands for social. Social factors is about social is basically about the people. Okay. So the people in the economy, so we would see what are the the cultural aspects of it, taste, preferences, um, to the education level, the male-female uh, ratio, the child um, and the adult ratio. See, all that ab about the people in the economy, uh, so the taste, the preferences. So those aspects are all considered under um, social factors. Then T stands for technological. Technological, so uh, the, um, the technology, uh, uh, the with that was adopted and the updations the all related to technology is up under technological factors then we see the environmental factors environmental factors if the organization has um because of the process there is a, some impact on the environment so 
um, those are called as environmental factors about uh, what's the carbon footprint, what are the rules and regulations which are laid out for the organization to fulfill um, in terms of minimizing on the, um, the carbon uh, footprint or the pollution, minimizing on um, the amount of pollution that can be created. Uh, it talks about the sustainability, how are they utilizing the resources that are available, the renewable, non-renewable resources, etc. So uh, everything about environmental factors. The last one is legal, talks about rules and regulations that are given out from time to time, which have to be followed, followed by the uh, organization. Those are called as legal factors. So political, economic, social, technological, environmental, Legal. Sometimes pestle is uh, presented in a condensed or a brief form, which is only pest. Whether it is pest or pestle, it means the same. So when it is just a pest, uh, it would be about legal and political will be clubbed together and it will be there under um, P. Uh, environmental, both the E's will be clubbed together. So economic plus environmental will be clubbed together. Whether it is pest or pestle, it, it basically includes all these aspects and what impact it, these factors have on the organization. That's about pestle analysis. Um, there's a model uh, given by uh, Porter, Porter's five forces of um, competition model. I mean, the image is quite simple, brief, um, but there are many things under each of them which we have to look into. See, how do we understand this particular model? How do we study this model? So if we talk about that, Porter's five forces model, Porter says that in the external environment, to face the competition, there are five forces. These forces are either a threat to the business or business has overcome them and they are, uh, they are not a threat to the organization because they have already overcome them and they are kind, the organization is kind of a leader in the market. So when the model is studied, theoretically, what does the model explain? We will be studying that. But anal analyze in terms of whether any particular thing is a, a threat or is it a powerful factor or they have already overcome that. So from that aspect, that per with that perspective, we study uh, Porter's five forces of competition. So first he says that, um, see, there is a threat of new entrants. So that's the first threat. Second threat is about the extent of competitive rivalry that is present among the competitors in the market. Oh, each one of each uh, one of these competitors can act as a threat to the others. That is competitive rivalry. Third and fourth ones are the um, see the image here is um, it. Both of them are buyers. See, it is about uh, this part of it is suppliers instead of buyers. This is suppliers. Sometimes the uh, suppliers are powerful. Sometimes the, sub the customers are powerful. So how to face the, uh, these stakeholders, the suppliers and the customers, and when they are powerful. So that is about the power of supplier, power of customer. The last one is threat of substitutes. Okay. So each one of them, let's discuss that in detail. If there are few players in the market, let's say three players are there in the market, 30% of the customers are with um, first player, 30% of the customers are with the second player, and 40% and of the customers are with the third player. So if we see that um, a fourth player wants to enter into the market, let's say there is a fourth player, if there are ABC present in the market, D also wants to enter into the market. See, at least no matter how small also, if some of the customers get attracted to the new supplier D, then each of them will lose their market share. 
to even if it is a small portion some of the customers get attracted to the new player so this new player is a threat to these existing players in the market the existing businesses in the market so there is threat of new entrants how do we study this this particular model so here is it theoretically we just study about that yes there is a threat from the new entrants we should further analyze about is it so simple that new entrants can enter into the market is it so easy or what factors act as a barrier to the uh, new entrants so new entrants are not uh, um, so it is not possible for them to enter into the market easily so that is that is how we need to look into the aspect of threat of new entrants i hope i am clear any issue are you able to follow me Are you able to follow me? Am I audible? Let me start on that note. Am I audible? Okay, are you able to follow me? Okay. Any issue, you can put it in the chat box. Um, class tenth is one one one, isn't it? You said one eleven. The more students in one eleven or one fifteen, you said one fifteen. Okay. Done that. <clears throat> So the first one, threat of new entrant, should be looked into as: um, are they uh, are are they really a threat to the business, or there are some barriers for the new entrants to enter into the market? Uh, how do we understand? How do we look at that? So let's say if the capital requirement to start the uh, enterprise is um, huge, then not everybody can afford. Not everybody uh, for them it is easy, simple to enter into the market. So. threat of new entrants um, or a barrier to the new entrants should be looked at as what is the capital requirement if the capital requirement is very less see it becomes easy for anybody to enter into the market okay enter into the industry start their own business unit but if it is quite high then in that case um, um it, it, it it may not be possible not many would be able to um, even afford that think about entering into the market another important aspect is what's the role of government so if the government is uh, very supportive it encourages new firms to um, be established from time to time it comes out with uh, different aspects uh, different uh, subsidies grants encouragement uh, um, coming coming out with the policy of ease of doing business etc so then many will enter into the market so then it is a threat if government doesn't extend any kind of such supports to the new entrepreneurs then not many would think about entering into the market so that's another aspect government aspect see uh, other aspects about um, whether it is uh, easy possible for new entrants to enter into the market are see the way the business is carried out by the existing players see um, if they start operating at a large scale then economies of scale can be realized economies of scale when they are realized the selling price per unit falls down cost per unit comes down selling price per unit also comes down which is not possibility because economies of scale will not be realized by new entrants until they operate at a higher capacity it is not possible so the existing players do enjoy the economies of scale and because of economies of scale they can offer the products at lesser price to the Uh, customers initially the new entrant will not even uh, have any amount of profit also realized until 
they reach the break even point at the break even point they start beyond the break even point they start earning profit so until they reach the break even point they cannot even think about giving a discount to the customers so then it, it would be a threat to the new entrant uh, or it is a barrier to the new entrant not to enter into the market economies of scale is one thing um, you have learned in pm uh, learning curve so learning curve is another thing because the same type of work is taken up again and again the amount of uh, time that is required to do the work reduces so that's the learning curve so when the labor hours are reduced then in that case the cost of labor also reduces because of uh, learning curve analysis they are able to realize those benefits which is not a possibility for new entrants okay then we see um, um maybe the existing players have invested a lot into research and development they come out okay one good news let me also tell you that so anybody scribbles on the screen name will be displayed okay try and see next time anybody tries and sees then i will also announce the name um loudly so some disciplinary action also will be taken up okay so don't try and see that you write you scribble anything on the screen your name also comes so it immediately gains my attention i will this time i will make a note of it and um, don't try that and then uh, fall into trouble okay so the existing businesses maybe they have spent a lot into research and development they come out with added features to their products um such such kind of research and development uh, it may not be uh, possible for the new entrants to take it up sometimes they may well funded they may be well funded they may be uh, spending a lot into research and development even before entering into the market such kind of things also we see the technologically with the quite updated technology new players can enter into the market so that is we, we are not ruling out the possibility but we see that mostly this is a possibility that existing players will be able to um, spend a lot on uh, um, research and development add more features to their product etc so that that those things would be um, preventing the uh, or um, the new entrants to enter into the market another aspect is see if the brand is well established people are so very particular about using the brand they do not like to try out anything new that comes into the market once they stick to a particular or when they are um, very well accustomed to using a particular uh, brand brand identity okay in all aspects all these five factors there is one thing called as switching cost so when Uh, they switch from uh, one player to another player switch from one product to another product suppliers they switch customers uh, they choose different customers to uh, or they use substitutes so, you know all these situations there is one thing which is common called as switching cost okay switching costs are see um see if they are associated with particular um, um entity a particular product or a particular brand group shop mall um so there are certain benefits that can be available as long as they are uh, members of that particular organization or they are uh, members of a particular group uh, they they um, are associated with the seller manufacturer so there are some uh, benefits which can be available if they stop being the members they will have to forego all the benefits so they cannot have the benefits let's say that the uh, um, subscribed members subscribed members are given uh, some um, preferences some priority some additional features some additional discount non members do not have that okay so if they switch from one player to another player they may have to forego the benefits so on account of um, losing those benefits many customers do not switch between players or entities so if it are switching costs are there 
switching costs will prevent them prevent them from um, uh, changing the players so if switching costs are there customers do not uh, very easily uh, get attracted to new players then we see that that will be um, a barrier to the new entrant okay so likewise we need to study about what factors so theoretically this is all the explanation but uh, in the examination in sbl examination uh, we need to identify what are the uh, those factors which are affecting that particular business so is it a threat or did they overcome that threat so from that aspect our analysis should proceed further and then comment upon that the second factor second force here is competitive rivalry the extent of competitive rivalry that is present among the competitors in the market um see uh, the common points with the new entrants are switching cost is one common thing if the brand identity is already well established so competition will not be honest if you know see no matter uh, what they do also the customers are kind of uh, Uh, hooked to a particular player or a particular brand, and they continue to buy from the seller. Other aspects about competitive rivalry, we see that um, see if the competitors are into diversified businesses, their focus will not be on only one particular um, um, business. Their focus is diverted, or it is spread up across multiple businesses. So they do not compete on a rigorous note so the competition is not so severe they compete on a lesser um, intensity because they are into diversified businesses their concentration would not be on any one particular business that's one factor next we can talk about um, is fixed cost so what's the amount of fixed cost which is spent the fixed cost is a cost which remains fixed till they reach the maximum capacity so um if higher amount of fixed cost if it is there until the fixed cost is recovered so fixed cost recovers only at the break even point we know that part of it see until they um, touch the break even point they cannot um take um, dynamic decisions about uh, giving a price discount etc or um, doing something about that it is not possible for the um, the competitor in the market because of the portion of fixed cost which has to be recovered less amount of fixed cost as soon as the fixed cost is recovered i think they can start thinking about um, giving a discount to the customers then the competi competition is on a different level see another factor is sometimes the competitors even if they want to quit from the market also so when they quit from the market there are certain additional overhead costs which have to be incurred just to um, not spend uh, um, on the overheads or uh, um, at least by by staying back in the market um, they will be able to recover some amount of overhead so for that reason they may though it is not very profitable they still continue to exist 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 in the market and not exit from the market so such kind of businesses are taking away the market share of the other players so that's another factor about um, the competitive rivalry so uh, we need to study about those things in that particular aspect third and fourth two different aspects are what's the power of suppliers and what's the power of customers power of suppliers and power of customers if we talk about that see these are the stakeholders who are present in the uh, supply chain what supply chain if we talk about um supply chain is the sequence of Uh, activities starting from uh, sequence of activities connecting from the supplier until the customer so all the activities that are connected from procuring the material from the supplier till the uh, delivery of the finished goods to the customers so in this supply chain 
we see first we would uh, we have this um, supplier in this supply chain material is received from the supplier okay we see that the business or a company is there which receives the uh, material converts this material um, into finished goods and these finished goods are delivered to the customer so sequence of activities now the concept of these two stakeholders suppliers and customers whether they are powerful whether they have the bargaining capacity or they are not powerful is dependent see is based on the point or on the fact that to what extent the business is dependent on them for raw material if the supplier um is he supplying the material a major part of the raw material is acquired or it is procured from one supplier few suppliers see they are completely dependent on that supplier let's say that there is only one supplier who can supply the kind of raw material which is required maybe sometimes rare raw material sometimes which is not easily available raw material exclusive suppliers so supplier automatically becomes powerful okay there is too much of dependence of the business on the supplier then the supplier automatically becomes powerful and he will have the bargaining power with him fine next if the output that is produced is purchased by um most of the output is produced by uh, the customers one customer or few customers um then the customers automatically become powerful see when they become powerful then they start demanding their terms and conditions about the price quality Uh, time of delivery etc so they will have the bargaining capacity with them they are powerful so two stakeholders one is supplier the other one is customer whether they are powerful or not is based on the fact that to what extent the business is dependent on them okay suppliers and customers now how to deal with this or um can the um, bargaining capacity of these suppliers and uh, customers be dealt well and then eliminate that see for that there is a concept called as integration i don't know whether you are aware of it or not the only time you are responding in the chat is asking your friends to admit me uh, admit them into the class i think that's the only focus you have whether your friend is there in the class or in the waiting room um there's a concept called as integration i'm really sorry i wrote something that integration let's try to understand this with a uh, simple example uh, the concept of integration um, forward integration backward integration uh, this talks about reducing the dependence on the um, on these stakeholders so if it is backward integration so if they go backward and reduce the dependence on the supplier that would be called as backward integration if they move forward and reduce the dependence on the customer for the purchase of the uh, to sell those products uh, to the uh, customers then Uh, we call that as forward integration so the concept of integration uh, will decide on whether the suppliers and the customers are powerful or not so that that is the aspect what we have to understand 
well, a basic example, let's see. If there is a baker, baker uh, bakes the products and uh, baker supplies them to a, a supermarket, some mall, uh, he supplies. Them. Baker acquires the raw material, raw material, the main raw material floor, he acquires from a supplier, okay? Then uh, bakes the products and then delivers them or sells them to the supermarket. Let's say this is an example. So to buy that dependent on supplier, to sell these baked products dependent on supermarket. Both of them then seem to be powerful because dependency is there. Now, if the, if the business does not acquire the raw material from the supplier, but rather makes arrangements for, um, for its own uh, um, bakery, so the baker makes his own arrangements, maybe produces a crop, um, makes arrangements for flour. It's not now no longer dependent on the supply. So what is the baker doing now? Baker is going backward, acquiring the raw material for the work to be taken up. So that's called as backward integration. So now the supplier is eliminated from the supply chain. They are making their own arrangement for the raw material. So the power of the supplier can be eliminated. Now the supplier is no longer uh, powerful dictating terms with the bargaining capacity what he has. Similarly, instead of selling it to a supermarket, the baker can start it his own outlet directly selling the finished goods or the baked products to the customers directly. So by starting an outlet, the baker is moving forward and um, may, uh, reducing the dependence on the customer and reaching out to the consumers directly, okay? That's called as forward integration. So when uh, integration concept is a possibility, either backward or forward, in that case, uh, the power, uh, uh, power is eliminated. So power is reduced, power is minimized. On the same note, on the note of uh, integration, supplier also can think about forward integration. So instead of supplier supplying the raw material, he himself can make the um, baked products. So the supplier is thinking about uh, um, making baked products, baking them, um, and then, so if he thinks about forward integration, he would not be supplying the raw material to the business. Okay, so then that will be uh, increasing the threat. That increases the power of the supplier. Supplier will now no longer be supplying the raw material to the business. Similarly, the customers like the supermarket can think about starting their own bakery. Instead of buying it from the present baker, they themselves can bake those products. That will be backward integration on behalf of the customer. Customer thinks about going backward and making his own arrangements to sell the products. That is backward integration on behalf of the uh, customer. So we should also consider that. Is there a possibility of the supplier thinking about forward integration? Then it is a threat. Customers think about backward integration, then also it is a threat. So to what extent are they powerful is what we have to study under the power of suppliers and the power of customers. The last one, the fifth one is about threat of substitutes. The substitutes, see the concept of substitutes comes into picture uh, or it is basically dependent on one fact whether the customers are okay uh, using any product. Uh, example is the uh, customers uh, so sometimes uh, some of them are uh, consumers use uh, tea on very particular to drink tea. They do not like to have coffee in place of uh, tea. Then in that case, see any kind of changes that happen with the 
uh, substitute products also that will not have an any impact on the consumer because consumers tastes are so very um, the preferences are so very particular so if such a thing is there if the tastes and preferences are very strong of the consumers then in that case uh, substitutes can never act as a threat otherwise they are a threat they are a threat the people drinking coffee or okay drinking um, tea then i think it is a threat threat of substitutes so these five forces theoretically the explanation in the study text is very clearly given so you study that but don't study as a theory but look at uh, the scenario wherein um, whether these factors are actually a threat to the business or the business has already overcome those threats so they do not have an impact on the business they do not affect the business so from that aspect we need to analyze the um, if time permits uh, definitely i will do one case study maybe not immediately the yeah, um, maybe in coming one or two days i will um, one or two classes i will take up a case study and um, we'll we'll try to understand how to attempt uh, such kind of case study with specific reference to porter's five forces so then uh, it will be clearer to you also is this clear is this clear there are only two answers yes no is it clear or any doubts you have okay um just take a 5 minutes break uh, break is don't have to go, uh, leave uh, the zoom meeting i just put the recording on hold for 5 minutes okay you can go for a small break now it's 10:33 on my uh, computer exactly 10:38 i'll start the class and uh, don't have to leave zoom everybody be here but you personally you can take a break so uh 10:38 i'll start the class again okay and we'll resume back so the next model uh, we're going to learn is about uh, another model given by porter um porter's diamond model so are all the students there for not to respond in the chat are you there audible am i audible okay hmm Uh, these models are all part of external analysis so um, that's part of external analysis pest analysis pest analysis pest or pest analysis then um, very in detail we studied just now about porter's five forces then porter's diamond model third one the many other models also but our syllabus has these uh, three models to understand the external environment um, well and then uh, respond to the um, situations in the external environment so here uh, porter um, recommends the business entities to enter into global market so he talks about uh, what are the advantages of entering into global market so So, what do you think are the advantages of a, a firm? See, anyway, they would be present in the domestic market. So, uh, when would they think, or why would they think of entering into the global market, or what kind of advantages are present if they uh, enter into the global market? Any one of you? That's a very general question. Why do business entities cons consider entering into a global market, foreign market? 
any one of you one one answer at least one point at least i do not know who you are because i am not even seeing you so you write a wrong answer also definitely uh, absolutely it will not have any impact um, it would only be some student has given in a wrong answer so on that note other than that there would be no um, impact there so try it out and then give a right answer wrong answer some answer answer you give why do why do you think that this is Uh, business uh, entities consider entering into the global market so that point uh, which semester are you studying in i can also think about whether i should ask questions or not you are in which semester So finally, students. So basically, I think uh, that's a very general question. So, um, why do you think, um, or what motivates them to enter into foreign markets? Okay, good. Good. Somebody has answered. Okay, to diversify their operations. Okay, to make good, um, good business connections and collaboration. Very good. That's one reason. Okay, diversification. Thinking about diversification because they they might have explored the market completely. Um, the market is. There mo there is no more possibility for them to grow in the domestic market. They might have reached out to all the customers in the domestic market. Uh, um, that they they try they feel a need to enter into another market where they can start once again. Start from um, start selling the products and um, services to the customers, and then explore the market, reach out to many in the market, etc. So that that's one uh, reason. So the desire to maximize their profitability is another reason. So they want to um, earn more profits, better profits, because um, reaching out to many others in other markets also is one reason. See, to make good business connections, yes, definitely uh, they can um, improve on their network, have good collaborations, network, um, think about um, joining hands with others, and then start uh, joint ventures, strategic alliances, or um maybe they can also in certain situations take over some other business also acquire another business also so those are the reasons why um generally i mean what attracts them to enter into foreign market porter here comes with a recommendation that business concerns should consider entering into a, a foreign market or global market the, the reasons why what he talks about are um so we see that the first one is about uh, the demand condition maybe the demand for their products is present there to explore that um they should enter into global market so the first reason what he talks about is the favorable demand conditions to um, capture those things and then get benefited out of that business concerns should think about entering into global markets that's the first thing the second one he talks about is the factors of uh, production what are the factors of production how many factors of production are production are there and what are they just tell me what are the factors factor conditions so what are the factors of production anyone at least labor very good okay labor is one factor no not material land land labor capital yes yes capital right 
entrepreneurship. That's right. Plan, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. If these factors of production are available, okay, to explore those things, also they can consider entering into a foreign market. So factors of production, factor conditions, if they are favorable factor conditions, see if they, uh, if there is um, uh, availability there, in that case, um, I think um, they should think about that. They should uh, consider or these factors are favorable. Land is available. Uh, labor is also very av easily available. Maybe they can afford to start that capital availability is there and entrepreneurship. So those skills that are required to start a new business in a new market, if these factors are favorable, then, then they should think about entering into a foreign market. Along with these factor productions, he also talks about sometimes there are uh, related and supporting industries. We suppose um, um, somebody wants to start an automobile uh, business in a foreign market. See, um, in that case, um, there might be some auxiliary units which can uh, supply components or some kind of support to the automobile industry. So such kind of related and supporting industries, if they are all present there, in that case, then uh, that will, will be great help to explore that. I think they should start their business in foreign market. Finally, the kind of um, competition that's prevailing among the competitors, the strategy, the structure and the rivalry, it is uh, possible for them to face that and uh, um, survive in that market, I think they should also be thinking about entering into a, a global market. So there are four uh, so which are in the form of a diamond, so it's called as diamond model. So Porter recommends business entities to enter into global market. Of course, this, this model is also criticized on several grounds. Okay. Um, so it's, it, it, it is criticized uh, that um, Porter has framed this model uh, considering um, uh, 10 developed uh, economies. So see the scenario in a developed economy is totally different from underdeveloped or developing economy. So what is, what is uh, favorable or what are the favorable conditions there? may not be present in an underdeveloped economy or developing economy. So what we are talking about, uh, the demand condition that is present in a developed economy, definitely that would be on a different note when it is compared to an underdeveloped economy. So he based his uh, theory, his argument uh, on uh, considering the scenarios that are present in um, 10 developed countries. So his model was uh, criticized on that note. Okay. Um, then, uh, one second. Sorry about that. Some kind, of, some amount of this. So, um, Porter's recommendation is that um, see the firms should consider entering into global market. So his criticism, uh, his model was criticized on the ground that uh, 
See, it is not applicable in all types of economies. The developed, underdeveloped, and uh, developing economies are not on par. Therefore, um, it is. Um, so the same scenario may not be applicable in all, all countries. Okay. Um, see, the times are changing now. People are now present uh, um, on the. Um, electronic mode um, and then able to provide um, different kinds of services. See, geographically, even if they are not present in a particular location also, so their uh, business is carried on. See, especially in uh, service industry, so consultancy businesses, etc. Physically, they may not be present there, but yet they, are, they do have customers and they do have a market through the electronic mode. Um, therefore, uh, it is not applicable to service industries, consultancy firms, etc. The, um, the whole of call center uh, concept uh, which has come into is they provide services, but physical location is in the domestic market only. But they, are, they do have customers in the um, foreign markets. So, it is, so, this particular thing doesn't apply to consultancy firms, etc. Okay. Um, then we see that uh, um, in the changed scenario, in the changed times, it is not so much about uh, the physical location. It is more about um, it is more about uh, capturing the customers and then um, through electronic mode and then carrying out their uh, businesses. So. Um, on those note, uh, the this model was uh, criticized. So he was always talking about uh, capturing the foreign markets, but he was silent about the domestic market, uh, what impact it could have when the foreign players enter into the market. So uh, that way he was silent uh, with his model. So um, see, it is more to more about managing uh, the firms rather than physically being present in a particular location okay that that is about um, Porter's diamond model which is one model under external analysis so we've learned about pestle analysis we've learned about uh, five forces of competition then this is diamond model after that so maybe um, Monday's class, I think. My Monday, um, Monday I will do one case study in the class on um, five forces. So if time permits or maybe um, we can also take up a, a diamond model also. A small case study if at all if it is there in the exam kit, we will take it up. But one definitely though I will do on five forces, but not right away, not immediately. So for some time we will con concentrate on the content. Content is um, vast. Vast is not the word. So the syllabus is quite vast. So even for your internal examination, also you have to study so many topics. So let's first, uh, at least to some part of it, we'll finish it off. And then uh, in between, we'll try to squeeze in one or two case studies and then study them. Next part of it is uh, after these models, then we have to take up the internal analysis. As part of internal analysis, the learn about what are competencies. Internal external analysis together it is what analysis. And then internal analysis, there is another model. This model again is given by Porter. We call it as Porter's value chain model. Okay, so let's take up these analysis. Um, The next um, part of it is study about what are the capabilities. Okay. Uh, this is part of internal analysis. So it's a matrix given. We see that um, on the horizontal axis, it's about the um, competitor, same as the competitor, easy to copy the competitor, or it is different from the competitor and difficult to copy the competitor. So that is uh, the variable on the horizontal analysis. On the vertical analysis, we have two variables. One is 
what are resources and what are competence what do they possess so that that's the aspect about um, on the um, vertical axis the resources what they um, what they have with them competencies what uh, abilities do they possess so basically it is about uh, on the vertical axis the resources and competence see anything whether resource or competency what they have which the competitors also have okay. so everybody is on par they have competitors also have nothing unique about that so they are basic resources because everybody owns them so what advantage would they have if they own those kind of resources or competencies are those skills or abilities which they possess if they are the ones which the competitors also possess in that case we call such competencies as threshold competencies resources would be basic if what they have the competitors also have so analyze that let's say the resources what they have the competitors do not have then they have unique resources that will give them a competitive advantage over their competitors so unique resources if the competencies competencies what they have what the competitors do not have then we call them as core competencies no the difference core competencies and unique resources give a competitive advantage to the business over their competitors they are apart from them they are ahead of their competitors they are different from them so they have an advantage but to survive in the market sometimes there are certain other um, resources like basic resources are required so now with the practice um, uh, the competencies what the competitors also have they would be on par the customers now may choose them they may not have a, a competitive advantage over their competitors but at least to be on par with their competitors such kind of skills such kind of abilities are required so they are threshold competencies so consistently if they do well with the uh, threshold competencies it does not happen that threshold will someday come uh, convert into core because they have that competitors also have so one will overtake the other one may not be a possibility but sometimes when uniquely uh, some resources are available with them unique resources are available with them certain skills and abilities where they possess which the competitors do not have yes they are uh, different from their competitors they are set ahead Uh, set apart they are much ahead of their competitors they can get the benefit they have the competitive advantage okay so analyze that about the capabilities then we see there is something called as csf critical success factors any idea what are critical success factors you should be having because you've studied it in some context i will um, remind you but let's see if there is anyone who can um, tell at least one simple thing about what are csfs any one of you please did you learn any time pm there is a model called as balance score card did you learn that balance score card are you did you ever hear about this concept called as balance score card
Okay. Silence is the answer for everything. <clears throat> what are critical success factors? So there are certain factors which are crucial, which are important, vital factors, which can ensure. So these are critical. These factors are critical. And if these factors do well, it can ensure success for the organization. For a student, how can a student um, achieve success in examination season? Become successful. The student, how can he become successful? So there are certain factors. We can call them as CSFs, critical success factors. Like hard work is one factor. Okay. Uh, intelligence is another thing. Individually, each one of them have a different uh, IQ. The caliber is different. So that is one important aspect. Hard work is one thing. The availability of time is important. The resources, availability of resources are important. See, um, let's say these are the four factors. Um, so if these factors are um, practiced well, taken up well, that will assure them success in the examination. See, hard work. We've identified hard work as a CSF. Mere identifying is it sufficient. I tell, uh, please put in hard work. You don't put in any hard work. Because I, if someone has identified hard work as a factor, is that sufficient? No. The candidate has to actually put in some amount of hard work. Put, has to focus on uh, studying, put in some work there, work hard, study for long hours or whatever is that. And then, then it would be... Um, it becomes possible for them to uh, taste success. So, intelligence based on uh, utilizing. Somebody may be very smart, intelligent, wise, but they do not utilize that. So then, um, to what extent did they utilize their intelligence, their caliber, etc.? See, if um, some of them may be engaged with so many activities, therefore they do not have time. See, the time that is available has to be devoted to studying the uh, content. So, time is an important factor, but utilizing the time is how we measure that. See, another aspect, um, what did we say? Resources. Uh, maybe they have easy access to library. They do have the textbook. They do have the material, soft copy, hard copy, name it, whatever it is. So, it, do they have an access to those resources? If they do have access to those resources, then they become successful okay um uh, like uh, in this example for a student if we are identifying multiple um csfs um for a business also there are many csfs so critical success factors so critical success factors these are factors which are very important, which can assure them success. So performance requirements that are fundamental to an organization's success. In this context, CSF should thus be viewed as those product features that are particularly valued by customers. This is where the organization must outperform competition. So they have to do well. They have to use these factors in such a manner that they outperform their competitors, then they can have an advantage. Should not get confused between what are CSFs and what are competencies. See, CSFs are, note that CSFs are competent and competencies are different. CSFs need to be good at, they have to implement them, they have to do well in terms of CSFs. Hard work, put in hard work, resources, utilize your resources, time, study, whatever are hours. Okay, so needs to be good at, competencies, focus on what an organization is already good at. What they already possess with them are competencies. CSF, they have to do them well. They have to do good in those areas. So those are CSFs and competencies. 
strategies need to focus on maximizing the correlation between them. Then uh, this one model given by um, Porter, where he tries to explain the explains the internal uh, environment, internal um, um, the, uh, within the organization, the internal environment is explained. For that, he takes uh, he explains that with the help of activities, the various activities that are carried out in the organization. By that, he explains about uh, uh, the structure of the organization, internal um, structure. So this model is called as value chain analysis. Ultimately, all with, the, with all these activities, how can the value to the customers be enhanced? So that, that, that's the concept here. So the activities are divided into two different categories. One is uh, primary activities. One more thing. Uh, is attendance taken in these kind of online classes where 115 students are there? This is a general question. No, you can answer this one. Should I be taking attendance? Because I have to allot that much time for taking attendance. Because marking 115 students' attendance is no joke. In the online classes, is attendance marked in LMS by the faculty? Nobody is listening to my class. Uh, huh, no, in the session only attendance is marked. That is my doubt. I'm really sorry. I TCS is. Older generation, I don't understand what is TCS. Please explain that. What is TCS? Ah, no. Sometimes you must have heard, no, in these last two years. Oh, oh. TCS start up. Let's see what we can do. Maybe five minutes time I should do a lot. I will allow. Okay, so um, he explains um, that the activities in an organization are uh, broadly categorized into primary activities and secondary activities. Primary, the main number that is carried out. So under primary activities, the first one, he talks about it as inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and after sales, customer service. These are primary activities. The logistics is uh, basically about the movement of material. So how the material comes into the factory uh, premises, inbound logistics. After the material comes into the uh, factory, then conversion of raw material, raw material gets converted into finished goods. That's the main operation for a manufacturing business. See, this model is not the same for a service industry. So, of course, we don't have that in the syllabus, but uh, the primary activities are replaced with something else in case of a um, service business. We are only looking at the manufacturing business here from that point of view. Um, first, the material has to be received into the factory premises. Then raw material gets converted into finished goods. That's the main operation. Then after the finished goods are produced, these things have to be moved out of the factory, outbound logistics. So they are moved out into the warehouses or showrooms. Okay, Outbound logistics. After the outbound logistics, uh, then um, See the 
products are produced but the information has to be conveyed to the um, customers attract them attract them convey the message that these products are available with them so take up marketing and uh, um, sales activities ultimately sell them to the customers uh, uh, marketing as part of that different kind of promotional activities advertising etc all those things will be taken up and the product the goods are sold to the customer see that would not be the end of the activity see even after the products are sold to the customers also um, sometimes there are certain agreements uh, which the seller um, enters into signs and then assures the um, assures the customers that any kind of a service which has to be provided um that within a stipulated period of time now it's not forever so based on the terms and conditions of the warranty guarantee the seller promises to provide certain services to the customers uh, in terms of repairs maintenance etc so some kind of services or uh, sometimes some parts are uh, parts or components are replaced uh, those things so such kind of things are um, promised by the seller to the customer so take up any activity about after sales customer service so these are all primary activities but primary activities are not possible without the uh, support of the support activities so we see there are four different types of support activities the first one is firm infrastructure next we see um, technology development then we see um, hrm human resources management um, and then procurement uh, if we talk about infrastructure infrastructure should be uh, easy way to remember see the facilities which are required so that the main activity can be carried out um, all the fixed assets basically so uh, it, they can be remembered uh, as pp property plant and equipment so property plant and equipment the land building plant machinery equipment loose tools etc so these things all should be available with them uh, so that the activities can be carried out it's just not that material is received received where into the factory so there should be a building there should be some premises land um, then uh, converting them into finished goods so some kind of equipment plant machinery equipment loose tools etc all those things are to be required so the first support activities are firm infrastructure property plant and equipment after that the technology to what extent did they adopt the technology what are the uh, updated versions the upgradation of technology etc so technology development third one is about hrm human resource management human resource management hrm activity um um See, when the work has to be carried out, um, people are required, staff are required. See, only um, when staff are available, then the work can be carried out. So, there is a function in the business which is called as human resource management function. Um, their work is to recruit, select, uh, appoint, train. After they are placed in their job roles, provide required training. Um, then observe the performance wrote down the performance then that would be connected to um appraisal um, some kind of reward um, bonus or something so taking care of all those things uh, until the time the uh, staff leave the organization right from the time they join the organization till the time they leave the organization everything that is required to be taken up is taken up by the support activity hrm human resource management so anything to do with the employees anything to do with the staff right from the time of recruitment till the time they leave the organization it is all taken care by the hrm activity fourth one is procurement see procurement is about procuring the material material just does not come into the factory inbound logistic just does not flow into the factory it has to be acquired see so the conventional way of procuring the material was see the um, the suppliers who are present in the market are called in to submit their um, quotations tenders 
then the supplier right kind of supplier or suppliers are selected orders are placed with the supplier based on the orders the supplier then supplies the material material is received at the factory it is um, verified for its quality then it is sent into the factory premises so it is a time taking process of procuring of late we see that this procurement has also become much simpler because there are electronic platforms wherein the um, all the suppliers supplying a type of material are present on the electronic platform the, the details are all about the suppliers their products etc the quantity quality price different aspects are all present or mentioned there on the platform so selecting the supplier and placing an order with uh, the supplier has become much simpler than uh, earlier days see that is e procurement we call it as uh, e procurement electronic procurement um see we also see that there are many platforms here in india as well um are you aware of any platform e procurement platform where we have the details of the suppliers present on the platform are you aware of it heard about india mart anytime internationally any um, platform their orders uh, can be placed with the suppliers because of the suppliers are present there choosing the supplier in the easy uh, placing the wholesale orders with the supplier any platform which you know find out at number because 113 students are there in the class right now not even one knows is uh, final year students expecting to join the corporate world very soon ah uh, that's it yes alibaba is one platform yes very good very good alibaba is one thing see in india also we have many such sites um, okay i gave one example india mart one example i gave okay there could um, there are others also um see um, things have become simpler like uh, it's it's now no longer uh, restricted to a particular geographical location um see the electronic mode after it has um, um taken up i mean it has become uh, popular then we see that uh, um across different regions also sellers are now being able to connect with the buyers see what amazon claims is it is apni dukan see people from uh, even remote locations the sellers those uh, people who can provide with their unique uh, um, products which are until now um, before the electronic uh, revolution that has taken place see, it was all confined to that particular area only when people visited those areas were able to have an access to that now there is no such thing see uh, after the electronic um, i mean revolution and the platforms which are there which are now connecting the buyers and the sellers see it is now no longer a subject or restricted to only uh, geographical regions okay so it is um, now it has become easy so now procurement also of course we can we talk about procurement also has become much simpler because of e procurement but nevertheless it is still an activity wherein at least from the platform choose the seller um, choose the supplier place an order with the supplier and then on receiving the order uh, the supplier sends the material so that is another support act now together the primary activities and the support activities um how the customer would be benefited so what um, benefit or what margin can be added to the customers or how value to the customers is enhanced is uh, what this particular uh, model talks about the next one
just now I did explain to you about uh, the SWOT analysis. Uh, SW uh, are internal factors, then we have OT are external. So take up an analysis, internal analysis and external analysis to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses, what are they good at, what are they not good at, um, understand those aspects of it. Um, then um, take up a study about the um, external environment where what kind of opportunities are present for them in the external environment and the threats that are present for them in the external environment. So <coughs> those aspects have to be um, taken up. And uh, see if the question says that uh, take up a spot analysis, we need to uh, understand. Uh, we need to understand um, from that particular organization's point of view, what are they good at, what are they not good at. So um, make a comment about that and then uh, how it is helpful in, uh, see, when SWOT analysis, any type of analysis, all these models, what we have studied in today's class about the internal analysis, the external analysis, um, different models. Um, see how they are useful in, strategic planning that's the first part what we have studied in today's class the, um, in this particular diagram about the strategic um, planning so these analysis are required to be taken up the internal external stakeholder analysis these analysis our appraisals are taken up in terms of establishing the objectives establishing the objectives what they should be achieving so uh, setting a target, setting, um, I mean, some task uh, can be decided or certain plans that are decided, which can be implemented um, in the future. So um, that is about um, the, the purpose behind that. So that will help in establishing the objectives on achieving these objectives. The overall, uh, ultimately, the overall purpose of the organization also can be achieved. Okay. So that talks about uh, um, how a different analysis can be taken up. 